One. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jacob and Jacob podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Pear, filling in for my co-host, Jacob Obam. I have my good friend, Benny Ehrlich. Benny, thank you so much for filling in for Jacob. And today, me and Benny are lucky to be joined by NFL Hall of Famer, former NFL Pro Bowler, former NFL All First Team Pro, and Super Bowl champion, Dan Hampton. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. I hope uh, you guys are doing well, and it's football season's right around the corner. The Bears play Saturday, so here we go. Yeah, I'm looking real. I'm really looking forward to the season. We need a season in a time like this. But Dan, I want to start quickly in high school. You picked up football late and later than most players pick it up. But how were you be able to become such an elite player so late, or start after starting so late? You know, and, and a lot of times, you know, when I give talks, I try to, uh, you know, instill in the, the young people a couple of three different concepts that I think it really helped me. Uh, one, I had goals, and I didn't really have them defined, but my dad had died when I was in eighth grade. And we were, I mean, we, you know, we, you know, be a lot, a lot of days there, would, there was no food in the refrigerator. So that's called motivation. And uh, so I had fallen out of a tree when I was 12 and it crushed both of my tibia and fibia in both legs. And I was in a wheelchair for five months and I wasn't supposed to be able to do anything really athletic. But all that being said, I knew that being 6'6", 240 pounds, hey, I have a chance. I have an opportunity if I can utilize this gift the good Lord gave me and Try to make something of it. Now, uh, I didn't, like I said, I didn't have a dad or uncles or anybody. Uh, I had great coaching. And I had a, you know, I, I think, I, and I hope kids today still have this, which is they, they have a, a heartfelt belief in, you know, joining, whether, whether it's a, a band or a football team or a church choir, whatever, whatever you do. When you, when you join it, you become a part of it and you are obligated to do the very best that you can. And I didn't know what my very best was, but I just kept trying as hard as I could. And, the, and kind of one real cool little, uh, what would you say, nugget that I've always kind of taken with me is where, where, whatever group you join, whether it's a political group or whatever, find the smartest person, find the best person, find the most successful person. In my high school football team, it was uh, a safety. And I watched how he prepared, how he worked, how he, you know, went through the offseason condition. And I wanted to be like that. Same thing in college. I, it, the best player was a safety, Bo Busby. I wanted to be like it. And then when I got to the Bears, boom, it was that guy right there, Walter Payton. <laughs> and whatever he did, I did. And if people follow those simple concepts, you got a good chance of coming out okay. So, I mean, it sounds like you or you did have struggles early on in your life, but, and it seems like you carried a chip on your shoulder. Did you use that chip or did you carry that chip on your shoulder over into college at Arkansas and with the Bears? Sure. Uh, again, you know, like I said, I grew up on a farm and we didn't have any money and I didn't have the best clothes. I didn't go to the high school prom. And so there's all this kind of a psycho you know, trap where you're going, oh, well, you're really not that good. But I always in my heart was saying, well, why not me? And, you know, the uh, the country group, the Judds had a song called Why Not Me? But that was, I, I wrote that song t 10 years earlier because I was watching the the, the elite players in, in high school and the ones that were getting recruited. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, I can, I can be that good. I can do that. And next thing you know, boom, I'm getting recruited. When I was in college, I wanted to kick ass of, you know, the offensive linemen that were two years older than me that all went and played a long time in the pros. But I, I was like, why not me? I, I was kicking their ass in college. Why, why can't I play in the pros? So it was, it was a chip on, on the shoulder. And it was really kind of cool when Mike Ditka came in after my third year. And he said, hey, we are the Bears and we – have a rendezvous with destiny. And we're not going to get there unless you make your mind up and you put a chip on your shoulder. And I'm saying, dude, dude, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> so uh, 
I want to ask you about your time in Arkansas. Um, you were on the 1978 Orange Bowl champion team that upset Oklahoma. What was the week, the week like uh, leading up to the game and with Coach Holt suspending uh, key players and everybody sprinting out of the tunnel? It was an amazing time. You know, I, I, I played two years in high school. Now this is my third year in college. So my fifth year in the game. And I'm like, holy crap, we're in Miami. We're in the Orange Bowl. <laughs> and even though we had a, a dorm incident where three players were kicked off the team before the trip. It was 88% of our offense. And yet, you know, the bookies panicked, the fans panicked, but Lou Holtz didn't panic. The night before the game, after our best player on the entire team was a guy named Leo Otis Harris, our All-American offensive guard, tore his leg up in practice, had to have uh, uh, reconstructive surgery. The night before the game, Lou Holtz basically said, look, Everybody else is screaming, you know, the sky's falling. But he said, everybody wants to talk about what we don't have. We don't have those three guys that were 88% of the offense, our two running backs and our best receiver. We don't have our best offensive guard. And everybody thinks that we don't have the attitude. But let's talk about what we do have. We got the best defense in the nation. And we did. We had a great defense. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to belabor it, but it was it – was, Unbelievable. Now, and, and guys, you, you're in Philadelphia. You ever been to Arkansas? You'll never be in Arkansas. It's a little bitty town, a little state in the middle of nowhere. And that's where I grew up. And I, I and we had this huge pride and we wanted to be great. Again, why not me? And anyway, we took great pride. And my four years at Arkansas, we won the Cotton, the Fiesta, and the Orange. You know, we tied the Fiesta. But we played in those three major bowl games. That'll never happen again, ever. But the point being is we had great coaching, and yet we all sold out and paid a price to be great. And that Orange Bowl was kind of like our opportunity to show that, yeah, even though we had uh, some players missing and, and everybody was counting us out, we were counting ourselves in. And I got to tell you, one of the coolest things – that ever happened was on Friday before, I think the game was on Monday night, maybe it was Saturday, two days before we work on special teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lou Holtz has uh, Steve Little, our punter come in and do a quick kick. He says, we're gonna have the lead late in the fourth quarter and they're gonna be uh, desperate to, uh, to get the ball back. And so we can't wait to fourth down. We're gonna put Steve Little in as a back, quick snap it to him and he's gonna punt the ball on third down. And we're all thinking, wow, this is great. We're going to have a lead against the number one team in the nation in the fourth quarter. It never really eventuated that close. We killed them 31 to six. But, but anyway, that was psychologically, that was a huge, you know, uh, uh, building block in us having confidence about playing them. Now, they were very good. They had four or five All-Americans. I played against a bunch of those guys in the pros. They had a great team. But that night, that given moment, we were so much better prepared and so much a better team. So I read that uh, Coach Holt said the first guys out the tunnel were starting, so everybody sprinted out. Is that true? No, I don't know. He, right before the game, we, we, he kids about this. It didn't really happen. But anyway, you know, we had about 60 guys on the travel squad. He goes, all right, everybody up. He goes, yeah, everybody in the nation will be watching this. They're expecting a slaughter. The number one team against – the lowly Razorbacks who have suspended, you know, virtually their entire offense. Nobody gives us a chance. They've got seven All-Americans. We have zero. They've got 13 guys on the All, uh, 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 Big Ten team. We've got three guys on the uh, All-SET SET team. Essentially, we have no chance. The last 11 out of the locker room have to play. <laughs> <laughs> But it, I mean, he told that joke on the Johnny Carson show. Jesus, that's forty years ago. That's a, but it was a, oh, it was a great time, great era. And uh, Lou Holtz was, uh, still is. He's a special man. So Dan, I want to shift gears to your NFL career because you were the fourth pick overall in the nineteen seventy nine NFL draft. In your first two seasons, you were flat out awesome. You were an All Rookie, a Pro Bowler, a second team All Pro. How hard was it to live up to the expectations of being a first round pick and a top five pick in the NFL? Well, I had so many 
hidden hands in my life, my career. One of them was Buddy Ryan. And Buddy Ryan, and I, the first day I went into training camp, and Buddy didn't know me from Adam. He, you know, had seen me a little bit. But <laughs> anyway, he uh, he says, he, he called me, you know, it, first he called me Super Rook because I was like uh, Charles Atlas throwing people around and doing that. But over the course of about three weeks of camp doing double days and really wasn't eating because I was working so hard. I was losing weight, losing strength. And then we got into the first preseason game and I didn't play so well. And Buddy, you know, in his, you know, uh, typical fashion would, you know, try to embarrass you in front of the, the team. And he goes, you know what? I'm watching the film. I was playing against Marvin Powell, who was one of the biggest notorious holders of all time. He was a good offensive lineman. But anyway, uh, I didn't do anything in the game, in the first preseason game against him. But he goes, you know, I've been calling you Super Rook, but you ain't no Super Rook. You're just a Big Rook. And so Big Rook was my name. But anyway, he came up to me after the first few days in practice, and he says, so I understand you come from Oklahoma. I said, yes, sir. I was born in Midwest City. And he goes, I was born in, uh, I think it was Vita, Oklahoma, and uh, grew up there and played uh, football at Oklahoma A&M. And so we, we started talking and we hit it off. And since I didn't have a dad, didn't have an uncle, didn't have no father figure, whatever, Buddy was that. And I, I wanted to impress him. I wanted him, I wanted him to, to appreciate me. You know, we all want to be appreciated. We all want to pat on the back. But I, I, I just, I said, there's no way I can, um, you know, I can look myself in the mirror if I don't just sell out and try to be the best I can be. And, you know, the Bears weren't very good at that time. And we, and th there was a handful of us that, that were starting like a counterculture and we weren't going to go along with it. We, we were going to do whatever it took to turn things around. And I'll never forget after the third game, I, I, I was playing the, that plan to run, you know, great, but I wasn't having any success rushing the passer. And then the pros, the pass, you know, rushing the passer and everything now. But even then, it was a big deal. Anyway, I didn't have any. So one day in a meeting, Buddy asked me about a player from Arkansas, Jerry Eckwood. And he goes, what do you know about him, Hap? And I said, oh, he's, Jerry's really, really fast. You supposedly run a 4-3-5 in the, in the combine. And Gary Fensick piped up, oh, yeah, you're supposedly a good pass rusher. <laughs> and everybody laughs at me. And. Later that day, after I was lifting weights, I heard a film projector running. Back then, it wasn't video; it was film projector. Mm -hmm. And I, I go down the stairs and I open the door, and in that room, we're getting ready to play Tampa Bay, and it was Ted Albrecht. Ted Albrecht was our left tackle, and he had the audacious job of trying to block the best defensive lineman in football, Leroy Selman, at that time in the late seventies, and. Uh, Anyway, I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm getting ready for Leroy and watching him. And I said, oh, okay. And he goes, hey, sit down, just watch. And I said, well, I'm like, sure. So I sit down and I watched 30 minutes of film and I watched how he kept people off balance and it changed my whole concept of how to play. And that weekend I had, I think, three sacks and was defensive player of the week and I never looked back. It changed everything. But it goes back to my earlier assertion that if you're smart, you find the best player or the smartest player and watch what they do. Well, I, I had not had a chance to watch the best defensive lineman. And guess what? It worked. So, I mean, I want to stick with uh, Buddy Ryan because we had Dick on the podcast a few months ago and he had nothing but good things to say about Buddy Ryan. But I think we all know you guys carried both of them off the field. And I don't know if it maybe caused a little tension in the locker room. You were there. So could you tell us? Did you ever sense some tension between Coach Ryan and Coach Dicka? Since, since they MF'd each other all the time, man. <laughs> it's crazy. Here's what happened. By the way, and again, I'm not, it's not about me, but I, late in the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl, I went to McMichael and I said, okay, well, we're going to win. So Dent and I, we know Buddy's going to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And you guys ruined him. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. No, yeah. that Rich Kotite and uh, Randall Cunningham stabbed him in the back. Horrible thing. But anyway, we'll talk about that some other day. <laughs> uh, I told McMichael, I said, you and Fridge pick up your daddy, Ditka, 
because Dick, uh, they, they were more friendly with Dick than me and Dent. He, Dick was always like uh, at odds with me and Dent because we're kind of outlaws and you know we didn't want to do all of it. You know, we would break curfew and crap like that. Anyway, I said, me and Dent are getting buddy and carrying him off. So Dick won't pout. Make sure you get him and carry him off too because we got to play for him again next year. So that's the way it worked. And you know what? 30 years later, now people still talking about it. So it was a really cool thing. But it all went way back. And, and after the 1981 season, Gary Fincic had a great idea. Even though we knew our coaches were going to get fired because the team was crappy, our defense had started off the season like 25th. And now we're like fourth. And we were, we were getting better and better as the year wore on. And – we wrote, and Fincy goes, I'm going to write a letter to George Hallis. George Hallis, the guy that started the NFL, the, the owner of the Chicago Bears. He's going to say, I'm, I, and he's going to say, look, it's your team. Obviously, sir, you can do whatever you want, but don't throw the defensive staff away so quickly. Look and examine what they've done. We've done blah, 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 blah. And we as a defensive team are unified in our belief that if you allow him to stay, we will become special. Mm -hmm. or how uh, 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 visionary was that call because if you if you google it right now the greatest defense of all time the 85 bears comes up so i mean in in a way Good question uh, it, it was it was it was amazing and when he went to philly with jerome brown and clyde simmons and those dudes they became the number one team defense in football like in 88 89 Mm -hmm. And then he went to Houston after he got fired. They were the number one defense in football. There's no secret. Or there was nothing complex about it. Buddy was an amazing coach. But the uh, to answer your question, we got Buddy rehired before Dicker was hired. And so in, in an abstract way, there was, you know, you know you're supposed to have like a, a, a organizational, uh, you know, the head coach and then the defensive coordinator. In Buddy's mind, they were lateral. He was essentially co-head coach. And Dick hated that and resented it. Buddy didn't give a damn. And so they butted heads on everything from draft picks to playing time for players and this and that. And by the end, they, they were, we were house divided. But you know what? It worked out. And, it, 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 and we didn't have to deal with it the next year because Buddy was gone. So, you know, it worked. And you know what? I got to tell you, you know, hostility breeds contempt a lot of times. And in football, that is a good thing. You can't play football in a good mood. You got to find a reason to get pissed off. And, you know, we were always on edge. And even in practice, you know, we would be beating the shit out of the offense and Dick could be screaming, I'm going to make it all live. We'd be taunting, make it live, who cares? And then we'd be going live tackling, you know, and training camp is crazy. But that's who we were. And, like I said, over the years, everybody, just like uh, Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, they were married three times, divorced three times. At the end, they loved each other again. You know, Buddy and, 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 and Coach Dick, uh, they kissed and made up. But trust me, there was nothing uh, cuddly about their relationship up until the turn of the century, for sure. Uh, do you think if Buddy stayed, you guys would have won more rings? Hell yeah. Yeah, we were number one the next two years, but we were a different defense. We were, a, a, instead of an attacking defense, we were a catching defense. And our defensive coordinator had basically, you know, uh, you know, bought the company line. And we were, we were, we were, we were, it, it, we were completely different as, as it could possibly be for the same nine or 10 players of the 11 to still start and be the same players instead of us attacking and, and doing the things that we did with the 46, which was, you know, buddies, uh, you know, nightmare uh, catastrophe defense for most offenses. We played basically vanilla defenses all year. And yet we still were number one. We were vastly different. And, you know, our, our so-called number one quarterback was only healthy in 85. In 86, 87, 88, we all had, you know, our backups or third and fourth stringers going. So it was uh, very difficult. I mean, 
playing with the 85 Bears and going 15 and one, how fun was it just to go out every week and just dominate opponents? It was really cool. Uh, you know, and, and I've said this before, just like I said, if you Google it, our defense is number one. If you Google the greatest NFL team of all time, it pops up 85 Bears. Okay. I didn't make that poll. I'm just telling you what it says. Well, that being said, when you're a little kid and you win your, you know, seventh grade football uh, championship game, you run around with your finger in the air. You're number one. Oh, you're number one. But really, you're not number one because the eighth graders could kick the shit out of you. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, after the Super Bowl, when we raised our finger number one, for the first time in history, I'd never won anything in my life. You know, we'd won some bowl games and all that, but I, I'm talking yeah. I'm saying major. We didn't win a national championship. We come in third. Anyway, for the first time in my life, I could honestly, with a straight face, go, yeah, we're number one. Well, that being said, that brings a certain, you know, target on your back for everybody else. Everybody else wants to chop you up. And just like you'll see this year, you know, Dallas is out to bushwhack Tampa in the opener. And then the second game, Tampa's going to have somebody, they're going to get their best game. It always happened. And that's the way it was the next year and the next year. Everybody, you know, wants to come after you. But all that being said, to get there, we had to obviously dominate in a certain way and you know, a certain level of, of you know, uh, performance. Well, Dick was the perfect coach to keep us at that level. Even though we played with three or four different quarterbacks the next year, we still won 14 games, 14 and two. The next year, with three or four different quarterbacks, we still went 13 and three. We still, we brought it. We always brought it. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of. Yeah, we only won one Super Bowl, but by God, we brought it for a long time. So, I mean, I want to stick with the NFL today. Obviously, you do some work with the Bears. You're a pregame host and a um, post game show for them, but they have a new quarterback, Justin Fields, and a lot of people aren't sure about him. Do you think Justin gets to start week one? No, he won't. And that's not the, the Nagy the head coach, you know, Matt Nagy's nature. Um, but guess what? This, this is, you know, we just got rid of uh, the number two overall pick in the draft because he summarily was a bust, you know, in Mitch Trubisky. So you're going to tell me that Nagy is the quarterback whisperer after you got the number two overall pick that not only can't play, but is released. I mean, there's a big difference between not playing and, and being on the street. Um, all I know is that there are, and I've watched a lot of footage of Justin Fields and there are, there, there's, portions of his tape that you say, my God, it's Patrick Mahomes. And he has that, uh, uh, that level of ability, but will he be able to adapt to the bigs and be able to make the decisions and avoid the bad place? We know he can make a lot of big plays. Can he avoid the bad ones? That's, that's the backbreaker. But here's the thing. Think about this guys. Where did he come from? Where did Ohio he come State. from? Ohio State. Okay. Who was the coach at Ohio State three years ago? Urban Meyer. Okay, why didn't he want him? If he's so great, why didn't Urban Meyer trade away the rights to the golden child and say, I can get four number ones. I can, you know, I'll be in the Super Bowl in three years. Why didn't he do that? If he was truly, you know, this generational talent. So I, I, I'm, ju I'm just asking, okay, there was three quarterbacks, one, two, three. We get to the 10th picks, nobody still picked him. We all know that every team needs a quarterback. Every team, you know, okay, even, you know, Mahomes, oh, there's five or six, you know, keepers. Everybody else, you know, would are desperately looking for the next big thing. The Bears had to come from 20 up to 11 to rescue him, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I'm just saying that I am hoping for the best, but I'm just saying a lot of the, the way the cards fell – make me say, wait a minute, what's going on? All I know is, like I said, he will be given opportunities in packages, like the second quarter, he'll come in and run four plays and then leave the game. You know, certain packages, if Nagy is smart, that's that's what I would do. And make defenses have to have a, a second dimension quarterback 
to prepare for. We know that Dalton is, you know, bread and butter and can't throw the burst out. But if you bring this kid in, my God, he can, and we'll see what happens. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. But once again, every year rings true with excitement. So I feel like, I mean, you've been around the Bears for a long time. Um, and the Bears throughout history, they've been, they've built great defenses, have had strong running games. They never really had that elite, elite quarterback. I feel like that's why every time you see a Mitchell Trubisky or Justin Fields, they might get overhyped because the Bears have never had that elite quarterback. Why do you think the Bears haven't been able to get the star quarterback when they've been able to have star players at every other position? That's a great question. You know, and I wrote this down the other day. I'm always coming up with little pearls of wisdom that I want to, you know, talk about on the radio. And to, But I'm, I'm like, okay, if you go to San Francisco as an offensive player, you're never going to make the record books. They got all these other, you know, Montana and and, and uh, uh, Jerry Wright. You, you're never going to make the, you never break any record. If you come to the Bears, you can have three good years. You can basically write the, write the record books. Now think about Allen Robinson. He will break the records that, you know, have been on the books for, I think, Johnny Morris played 50 years ago. You know, great player of, uh, I think, the 60s, late 50s, 60s. Uh, he's still the number one receiver. You know, Allen Robinson it, with, not, with the team essentially being a rumor on offense, he's going to rewrite the record books. I'm just saying, you know. Other than the rushing things, which of course Walter Sayers, um, you know, a lot of great back, but the receiving and quarterback records, I think Cutler's the uh, the guy that leads. Uh, if I was a quarterback, I'd I'd be in a fist fight trying to get to Chicago because you could become the man, you know, in, in a couple of years. Everybody, it, it, we're we're desperately seeking, you know, stabilization at that position. We haven't had it. You know, even our team, like I said, you know, McMahon played seldom. And they haven't, I think they've had 36 different starters since Aaron Rodgers started his first game in Green Bay. Think about that. Aaron Rodgers started, what was it? I don't know, 13 no, years ago? 2006. What was it? Well, he was drafted in 05, so I think he started in like 07. So in 15 years. 15 years and... And, then, and he didn't play for a couple of years um, because Brett Favre, another Hall of Famer, one of the greats, was there. Well, we were putting visine in our eyes to watch the bullshit we were, were, were trotting out at quarterback. Anyway, think about that. In those 14 years that he started for Green Bay, we've started 36 different quarterbacks. Started 36 different ones. There ought to be some kind of a law against that. I mean, let's say I, I press the restart button on the whole offseason and I let you pick the quarterback for the Bears this season. Realistically, who would you have tried to got or get and why? Rephrase that, Jacob. So, I mean, if you were the GM and I let you pick the quarterback for the season, either it could have been a move in the draft. What would you have done or a free agent signing? Because would you still go with Justin Fields? Oh, if I had to do it over again and we go back to April and before the draft, would I have changed things? I don't know. I'll tell you. They, uh, you know, they, they, they draft Trubisky after they signed Mike Glennon to $20 million a year uh, you know, uh, contract. Yeah. One I mean, of the worst contracts ever. And, and then they signed Foles. And then the whole time they're, they're running the ball with Trubisky. And yet he's, he's incapable of, you know, connecting and making, you know, enough plays to, to score. So we put Foles in who has virtually no escapability. And, and so we ab abandon the running game and then put him in the uh, seven, eight step drop 45, 50 times a game. And he takes a beating and uh, everything they're doing is it's crazy. So you have to, I would have to, if I, if I was making the picks in April, I would have had a lot different coaching going into April. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm look, here's the, here's the deal. We are desperately looking for the answer at quarterback. Will Justin Fields be it? I don't know. But if you're going to go with him, think about Herbert and, and the kid in Cincinnati last year, 
aware of that were doing tremendous things as a rookie. And yet, okay, we draft this kid and he's supposed to have that type of ability, that type of qualifications. Oh, wait a minute, we can't play you because we got, uh, you know, the clod, the, the red rifle in the way uh, because we're paying 10 million a year. So everything they're doing is so convoluted. And it, trust me, this all, this is all transmitted to the players, not just the quarterbacks that are in that room, how stupid everything is. And, oh, we got Foles and we got rid of Trubisky. And now we hired, hired Dalton. And, and, and well, you know, I think uh, Dalton, uh, what did he rank? 23rd with the Cowboys, 25th in QBR. 25th <laughs> in the league with Dallas Cowboys last year. And they got superior offense players all around us. And we think he's going to be the answer. So I'm just saying, don't put me in that box because I don't want to be in, I wouldn't be in that box. So I just want to ask you, um, uh, you, you, you made the Hall of Fame in 2002. When you retired, uh, on a, did you think you had a shot at the Hall, you had a good shot at the Hall of Fame? What did you think your chances of the getting in were? And what was that call like when you got in? No, well, obviously it's uh, it's the granddaddy of the of the award banquet halls. Uh, it was great. Uh, you know, I, I was ambivalent in a way. You know, I was defensive player of the year one year. I was see if you okay. You kids probably don't know, but you know, for five years, our defense terrorized the league. But I, in an abstract way, was, and I never really talked about this, but it would be like you, you know, you, I had, I, I started my career off playing three years at left defensive end and then buddy, Alan Page retired, he was in the Hall of Fame. And so I moved to right tackle and uh, I played three years at right tackle. That's where I was defensive player of the year and a couple of times in the Pro Bowl. And, I, and then Dick uh, drafts William Perry, the refrigerator. Now we had my, Steve McMichael who was playing at an all pro level and we had the fridge. Fridge can't play in. Somebody's, you know, only got two tackles. Somebody's got to go. So I have to go back out to end. So I played three years more out at end until Fridge kind of got real heavy and broken down. And then I moved back and I, I, I got kind of broken down. I was going through my 12, 13, 14th knee operation. Anyway, so I, I moved back inside and I finished up my career inside. All that, all that said, back and forth, back and forth. The whole time when I was inside, I was battling Pro Bowl votes with Steve McMichael, my teammate. And then when I was at defensive end, I was battling Pro Bowl votes with Richard Dent, the other defensive end who is also in the Hall of Fame. So it was a it was a bizarre uh, happenstance that all those things were, were going on at the same time. Um, so, you know, everybody wants to look at, oh, how many times did you make all pro? How many times? Not how effective of a player you were. You know, uh, you know I, I'll tell you this real quick story. So I was I retired in 90. I became eligible for the Hall of Fame in 95. Mm -hmm. That was in the final 12, didn't go. Next year, I was in the final 12, didn't go. And by 97, more players come and I was out, okay? And I thought, okay, well, you know, the Bears do virtually nothing, zero, zero, trying to help you get into the Hall of Fame. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's just like the Razorbacks. You know, the Arkansas Razorbacks, I'm not in the College Football Hall of Fame, but I'm the highest draft pick in the history of the state of Arkansas. But, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. It, it, the, so I, I kind of said, say la vie. You know, it is what it is. It doesn't change the way I'm going to play golf today. So here we <laughs> go. And I got a phone call in the year 2001. It was in November. And uh, the, the guy goes, hey, don't hang up. My, uh, my name's John Turney. And I said, okay, what can I do for you, sir? And he goes, I'm a cruncher. And I go, what do you mean a cruncher? And he goes, I am kind of like a freelance football writer, blah, blah, blah. And every year I do a bunch of crunching on the stats and blah, 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 comparing Terry Bradshaw to Steve Young and and Joe Montana and, and, and kind of getting a, a relevance of who was really truly special and who was maybe a product of uh, what would you say, uh, you know, uh, the media. 
anyway, I said, so he goes, well, I got to tell you, I've been looking at the 12 years you played for the Bears, the 12 years from 79 through 90, the 12 years you played for the Bears. It's never happened in history, but you guys were number one in nine of the 10 categories that everybody looks at. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you were number one in yards allowed, number one in sacks, number one in touchdowns allowed, blah, blah. And I said, really? And I said, so that's pretty good. He goes, it's unbelievable. He said, for instance, Joe Green, who I think is probably the greatest defensive lineman of all time. He said, Joe Green, the Steelers, the, his 13 years, they were in the top five in a and half of them and like 10th. And I said, really? And think about how many Hall of Famers they got. I said, what about Randy White in Dallas? He goes, oh, they're in the top 10 on a bunch of them, but they're not even in the top three or four anywhere. I said, so every, and every stat, and I got this, this, and he, he said, I'll fax it to you back then, you know, the fax machine. <laughs> he said, I'll fax it to you. And I got it over here at my desk somewhere. Anyway, we were number one in virtually, anyway. At that time, there was a guy named Don Pearson, who was a writer for the Chicago Tribune. His job was to be my lawyer, plead my case, basically say, Dan was great, and he did this, and he invented the Gatorade dunk, and blah, blah, blah. But evidently, he did essentially nothing. So uh, by that time, there was a guy named uh, um, Dan Pompey. And Danny Pompey, was now the guy that was doing the the pleading. He, wait a minute, I think it was still Pearson. I think it was Don Pearson. Anyway, I said, look, I called him up and I said, all right, look, I want you to take this letter and send it to the other, you know, voters in the Hall of Fame. And if it's not too much trouble, you know what I'm saying? Well, if, if, evidently he did. And that year, the very first vote was me, and I, I, I made it. So if it wasn't for an obscure phone call from a guy out in the middle of nowhere that was doing a bunch of number crunching, I may not be in the Hall of Fame. So am I thankful? Hell yeah. But in a way, the chip's on the shoulder because, you know, it's never happened. And again, it, to this day, it's never happened anywhere, anytime. And yeah, I had some great teammates. Richard Dent came in 83 and Singletary came in 82 and Mongo came in 82. So, but for the 12 year duration to be number one in everything. And I was the only common denominator of the 12 years. It kind of, I, I'm not trying to beat my chest. I don't have to, I'm an old man. I'm just saying it, it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing that everything happened the way it did that eventuated in to their being alerted to the fact that, hey, maybe I was a pretty good player. Well, Dan, that's an awesome story. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today and speaking with me and Benny. We really enjoyed our conversation with you. And we'll be looking forward to hearing you this season for the Bears. And it's an interesting season for the Bears and Chicago. So thank no, you. It's going to be a lot on. more interesting for the Eagles, I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah I don't even know. It might be Deshaun hey, Watson. I'm, I'm so glad Dick mentioned me, right? Yeah, I must yeah. really be on his mind. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. See you soon.